This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice. What a great video uh, we had the opportunity to watch. And, and throughout the series, The Ripple Effect, just seeing people do the work of God and see disciple making in the lives of everyday people. That makes it so important to us and it makes us understand and see where God is leading us as a church. But sometimes, you know, when we look at the videos, they do it so well, the people the discipleship, we sometimes think, oh, well, I can just jump in and do that. But it's a little harder than that. You see, because disciple making is a process. And it's a process that starts with inside of each and every one of us. And once we learn, then the ripple effect takes its course. As we've been speaking over the last uh, few weeks, you heard uh, Pastor Scott, big deal as I like to call him. <laughs> he made a statement, he said, no other person in history has made the impact that Jesus has and is still having in the world. I mean, you think about it, just imagine, like Jesus took 12 people and he discipled them, and 11 of them went and turned the Western world upside down and started a faith that we can understand and even believe today. But all that began because God wants us to learn the ways of Jesus. God used them to turn it upside down that we may learn the ways, so that our ways may be Christ's ways. And like Pastor Kent said last week, we just want to be like Christ. I don't know about the tongue thing, but we'll work that out with him later. I don't have a name for him, I just call him friend. Today I just wanted to talk to a few of us about developing the ways of Jesus and incorporating them into our lives as explained by Dave Buren. It's a process referred to as transformation. Transformation being that process that teaches us and leads us to be as Christ has led. He says in this process of transformation, the result in the end is just that, it's transformation, which I would say it means to have transformed lives. It's, it's in the light of the Apostle Paul said, seek ye not this world, be ye not conformed to this world, but be what? But through the renewing of the mind, be ye transformed. So our minds and our persons are, are transformed. But again, I know many of us are used to methods. You know, there's three ways to do that, and five examples of this, and seven habits of that, and 12 steps of something else. It's not that. There's no method that you go through, and once you finish this method, you're a true disciple or true transformed person. Again, as I said, it's a process, and really the, the process goes throughout the life. But Dave kind of illustrates it in this way. He says that the process begins with revelation. After revelation, there's a time where obedience has to be performed. That's our part. And then again, the end, end results are what type of lives transform. I'm going to say that again today. What type of lives transformed? And in this, it's very important to know that the process does not begin with us. We don't wake up one day and say, I'm going to transform my life. I'm going to read the book. I'm going to get disciples and it's over, we're going to ignore that. <laughs> God initiates the process through revelation. God initiates the process through revelation. From our understanding of Jesus' ministry, we know that Christ's ways are God's ways, and God is three in one, Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and God coming to us in the flesh to teach us his ways. So if we want to know God's ways, we have to learn Jesus' ways. And he does that. And he reveals it in the life of Christ. Just think about the childbirth. Jesus being born to Mary. 
God had to reveal God's self in that, that even that miracle would take place. When Jesus started his ministry, God made another revelation. When Jesus was coming from Galilee, he, he walked to the Jordan and he saw John there. John was baptizing people. And they looked at each other and they had a discussion about who should baptize whom. And they finally got it right and Jesus was baptized. And the Bible tells us that when he was baptized, they heard a voice from heaven. And he saw the doves and the light came down him from the Holy Spirit. That, that was the world and the Jewish population being able to see God. And then God, again, will reveal God's self at Jesus' death on the cross. The Bible says then, in Matthew 27, 50, 51, it says, And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom, and the earth shook, and the rocks were split. That's the action of God unveiling God's self. That's why it says it was ripped from the top to the bottom. The significance of that is in the Old Testament, when they had the Ark of the Covenant, and it was in this special room of the temple, and only the priest can go into that room when they were offering a sacrifice, and no one else can go into that room. But this was the point where God said, I am ripping that down so the whole world can see me. It's an unveiling. I was talking to Pastor Ken about this unveiling. He likened it to a curtain is opening on a play. I, I think about this week and well, something that came out. What was that? Uh, iPhone 28? No. It's, it's like the iPhone 6 came out and the market was going crazy and they shut down Apple, and everybody was waiting with anticipation. What's going to happen? What's going to happen? And here comes this man across the screen, and they unveil his new iPhone. That's how we should be when God unveils things to us, because that's God's revelation. We should have that type of excitement and that type of anticipation. But really what I just wanted to say was God initiates the process of attaining Christ's ways through revelation. So you may be looking like, Pastor Freedom, how does God reveal God's self to us? And my easy answer is be through the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit speaks to us. And each of us who have Christ inside of us have the Holy Spirit inside of us so those things can be revealed. Now, everyone does not see the revelation as Jesus did. Everyone does not walk up to the burning bush like Moses and and say, hey, God, I see you. And not everyone hears like Abraham to leave this land and your family and go to another land where I'm telling you to go. But we have revelation because the Spirit wants us to have it. The Bible tells us all about it. The Bible, the, God can speak to you in any way. He can speak to you in your discipleship class. God can speak to you during a sermon. Um, he spoke to some people in the Bible through a donkey as he reveals himself and through prayer the many ways of God. But what's revealed sometimes good for us and sometimes is not as good as we would like. God will always reveal his grace and his mercy. He will always be merciful to you and to show you his compassion through God and through his people. But there are some times where God's revelation will convict us. It will show us a picture of, of who we really are, and, and there will be requirements that we change from who we are to who God wants us to be, because remember, God wants our ways to be like Christ's ways, and I don't know, I can't say here today that I'm fully 100% like Christ, but I'm willing to listen and to hear what God reveals so that I could someday be like Christ. I remember, as many of you know, I've been dealing with well, I've been healed of the cancerous tumor, but the steps and process is not over for me as I continue to go to physical therapy three times a week. That's when you pull off and say, oh, no. <laughs> not at all, because God is great. But during the time, you know, people say, oh, pa Pastor Freedom, I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. And I have to look people in the eye and say, please don't be sorry for me, because at this point, I thank God. I thank God for the many times he brought me to him. I thank God for the many revelations that he had given me during that time. I remember my prayer time, he revealed to me 
that he shall deliver me. I remember when I was reading the scripture and he told me that there was no plague that's going to take your life. And I remember during my time of just sitting there and, and meditating, he, he revealed to me that there's no one like Christ. And if you believe and trust me, I will get you through the way. But there was also a time when I was sitting there and he was showing me that there were some ways that you need to change. You need to be different. You need to be more like Christ once your healing takes place. You must have more of the word of Christ inside of you. You, you must have less of, a, of the temper and the frustration and the impatience. You have to be a different person. And I was like, God, this hurts more than a tumor. <laughs> but when God reveals God's self, sometimes we like it and, and sometimes it's just displeasing. But this revelation is God initiating this transformation in our lives. It's God initiating. And it's good to say God initiates and God gets us on the way. And sometimes we're okay with that. Oh, God, oh, he's going to take care of it. You know, sit back and say, there's no worries. All things belong to God. And he'll lead me according to his plan and his desires. But that's right. But in this process of transformation, remember, we're transforming to be disciples who are disciple makers. So our part in that transformation is obedience. Obedience is our part in the process. Peter Forsythe, I think he said it right when he said, the first duty of every soul is to find not its own freedom, but to find its master. Y'all hear that? Not to find your own freedom, but to know who your master is. And that's Jesus. And that's God. So we look at o obedience. I want you to bear with me a little bit. I was challenged with some Hebrews by some other pastors, so I'm going to put mine in the sermon as well. The primary word, <laughs> Hebrew word for obey is shama. It is a root word meaning to hear intelligently, to consider and consent with contentment, to dil diligently discern and perceive with the ear and to give ear. Now the Greek word is hupokeu, which expands the Hebrew meaning of obey, which hupo means under. It's a place of beneath. It's an inferiority. It's like a submission. So you know you're listening and you're submitting. Um, Akeu means to hear and to understand. So you put it together means to listen attentively, to heed or confirm to a command or an authority. It's giving your ear understanding and listening to God intently, you know, it's hard when we're busy all the time. When, when we wake up to jump in the shower, to get to work, to get home, to eat dinner, to get back in bed. It's, it's hard to listen to God. But intently to listen to God because God will speak to you while you're driving to work. He'll speak to you in a song. He'll speak to you through a neighbor, through a co-worker. But if we're listening intently, we can hear what God is actually saying to us. And then with reverence, we give God what God desires is our attention and our ear. So obedience is important. And I want to say that obedience is not an option. It is not an option that God gives us. You don't believe me? Let's go to the Word. The Word says in Deuteronomy 11, 26 to 28, Behold, I set before you this day a blessing and a curse, a blessing if ye obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day, and a curse if ye would not obey the commandments of the Lord your God, but turn aside out of the way which I command you on this day to go after another God which ye have not known. A blessing to obey and a curse to disobey. Obedience is not an option. You see, we have so many options these days. And when I say option, this is what I'm talking about, like the act of choosing to have a choice or the freedom to choose and in our life today, especially if you have some little education or if you had a few jobs in your life, you have some experience, your options increase. Now, some people in the world's options are better than other options, but I'm not here to talk about that in this sermon. But think about it for a minute. But no matter what, we all have options. I can decide what car I want to buy. 
I can decide what I'm going to eat tonight. Some people choose and have a selection of who they're going to marry. This one, that one, or that. Just way too many options in this world. And then with those options, we feel like we have that same sort of option with God. But obedience is not an option. When the revelation comes to you and you hear God say, you must leave your job because it's unhealthy for you and your situation. If God reveals that, you have to obey it. If God tells you to turn down that new job or that promotion that you're about to get, you want that option. Do I take the other job or do I take the promotion? If God's given that revelation to you, there is no option. Trust me, God's way is always the best way. God may ask you to sacrifice your career for your family. Like give your time to your family. We give 80 hours to our career and 10 hours to our family. Like God is trying to reveal something in the midst of that. But God is in the world everywhere attempting to reveal who God is to each and every one of us. I, I think that God is trying to reveal that men have to stop beating on women. That's not an option. It must stop. Now, I'm not quite sure I like how it's being portrayed today as only these tough, rough football guys are beating on their wives because we know white men, black men, Chinese men, Latin men, all have that issue. When God says it's time to stop, we have to stop. And I'm going to be honest with you, I know a couple of women have a, who have a few nice right hooks <laughs> that they need to stop abusing their man, if not physically, verbally. It's God speaking to us and God revealing, and God wants us to obey those truths. And he will reveal us, he will guide us, he will lead us, and he expects us to hold his truth. The Bible says his truth, his truth shall be your sword. Obedience is an option. Because obedience, it brings us near to God. Now, I want to read from John 14 and 23. It says, if anyone loves me, he will keep my word and my father will love him and he will come to him and make our home in him. Like God saying, if you obey, if we obey the ways of Christ, like God is guaranteeing that his Holy Spirit will make a home inside of each and every one of us, that it would live and guide us and, and lead us. And sometimes we're okay with God's arms being stretched out. Reading the Bible, God's arms are stretched out to us. And God, he stretches his arm and that's okay. But see, sometimes we can disobey it because God is over there and it stretched our arms over here. And when that command comes or that revelation comes, we'll say, God, not, not this time. Like when God was telling me, like, you're going to preach. I'm like, I'm trying to go to medical school, I'm trying to play football. Not right now. But that wasn't an option. So God took all that away, and here I am before you today, preaching. <laughs> Amen. But obedience brings us near to God. I'll tell you one thing that I learned about obedience. It's not an option when you have no other options. Sometimes God puts us in a situation where we have no other options. All options have run out. Finances have run out. The doctors no longer have an idea of, uh, of what is happening or how to cure it. And then we realize that we are down on the floor, face down, prostrate, asking God, I need you to step in. See, sometimes in those life moments when we realize that there is no more option, I realized that several times in my life. Like, God, you're all I have. That's because you're all I need. And it moves from this of God having his arms stretched out, now I feel closer to God through those instances. I feel like God has brought me into his bosom. And now this is where he carries me. And this is where he shows me that he loves me. And this is where he guides me and instructs me and teaches me. And he says, keep being obedient because this is where I want you to be. God wants that for all of us. He wants us to be obedient to his word. He wants us to hear all that he has to say. And one of the greatest things that we could be obedient to Christ's word 
is found in Matthew 28, 19 through 20. He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of age. God reveals, we obey. We become disciples and we what? Make disciples. I think everybody in all our campuses, Swickley, Oakland, Easton, Dormont, Wexford, you all missed that. So I'm going to do it again. <laughs> God makes us disciples so we can do what? Make. I think you all got it now. The last piece that Dave talks about is that with the revelation and the obedience is that actual change. Is that process that happens inside of us where we become a new person. He says the end result is transformation. Transformation is the inward spiritual renewing of the mind that will manifest in outward actions. Sometimes I think about the mind because often we have, I, when I teach, I, I say we have stinky thinking. Like stinky thinking. Like if somebody's late, we'll say, oh, well, that person's late because such and such and such and such. Or if that person, if there's a person downtown and we see them with rags on, we'll say, well, that person's in that situation because that's where they put themselves. You know, we, our mind prejudges who people are and, and what people can do. And I say that that's stinky thinking because God calls us through this process so that our minds can be renewed and changed so that we see people as God sees us. And if God sees us in the likeness of his son, who is Jesus, then we should see people and greet people and talk to people in the same way in the likeness as if Jesus was inside of them. Now imagine how your life would change if every conversation you had, you talked to that person as if you knew that Jesus was listening to everything you said. When I walk across the street in Homewood and someone from the suburbs drives down the street, they probably wouldn't lock their door when I walk by. They might think of me differently. The people in Homewood would not think of the people in the suburbs differently as if, oh, well, people think this way or that way because we won't see each other as the world tells us to see each other. We'll see each other as God sees us. And that's the point of transforming transforming from the inside, letting your mind begin to change and letting the ripple effect of you go to everyone else who are in your circle. It's becoming a new person in Christ. It's walking differently and talking differently. It's, it's having the ways of the world no longer be your ways. It's a real complete change. It's not like a semi-change. It was a story of this lady, and she was telling her testimony in church. And she was so glad that God had saved her and transformed her. She said, church, I, I'm so glad for my transformation. She said, just a year ago, I had this uncle that I couldn't forgive. And I said that if he dies, I would never go to his funeral. In her half transformation, she responded, today, if he would die tomorrow, I would be the first one in line. I think y'all missed that. Think about it on your way home. <laughs> Transformation, as explained in 2 Corinthians 3 and 18, is this. Paul says to the church of Corinth, And we all, with unveiled face, beholding the glory of the Lord, are being transformed into the same image from one degree of glory to another. For this comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. Together the church says, amen. We are changing. God is making us new. We're talking to people with whom we've never talked. We're sharing with people with whom we've never shared. I think of Pastor Brian McKay and his wife Julie who moved into Homewood and are helping the people in Homewood and they're being transformed by the young people coming to their house. And as the young people come to their house, and some of them are used to just running in and grabbing food, and as they're learning Pastor Brian and Julie's way of, of sitting at a table and having a meal, the whole family is being transformed. 
sharing one with another that which Jesus gives to us. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. We, we don't want everybody from the suburbs running the homewood. I got to have somewhere to go every night. Now, how do I come out of that one? Being transformed. Having God reveal something to you. Being obedient. And allowing that process to take place. To be transformed from the inside. I liken this to when I was young. I was, I was born in Pittsburgh and then I moved to Chicago. When I got there, my family, uncles were going to this little Baptist church and they were on fire every weekend. So I just love going to church. And I really love going to youth group. But one of the things I liked in the youth group is every year we would go to Six Flags Great America. They had just opened. And every year they had a new ride. And my mother told me that when we go, we we're going to get on this roller coaster. It was called the Eagle. I think that thing went up about 200 feet and came down at 500 miles an hour. And I told my mother there's no way I was going to do that. But they kept promoting it. It was going to be revealed, this new ride, this new ride. And we get on the bus, and we get to Great America. I see the ride, and I'm just nervous. And as soon as we get to the park, the kids went to the left. My mother grabbed my hand, and we went to the right. We were going straight for the eagle. And we're standing in line, and the guardrails are leading us. Of course, we were in line for about two hours. And all the signs and the people are talking, oh, this ride almost gave me a heart attack. That wasn't helping. And some were saying, this is the best ride ever. And we finally got to the line, and we got to the deck where the train is. And we got ready to pull up, and there was millions of people there. And of course, my mother wanted to get on the first train with her young son. So we waited, and as it was our turn, I got ready to step into the car. And I sat down, and the conductor said, strap your belt, and I strapped my belt on. And I'm like, this thing going to really help me. And then he gave us the rules. He said, don't stand up. Said, no problem here. <laughs> Keep your arms in the car and enjoy the ride. And we were going up, and people were yelling and screaming, and some of them were disobeying the rules, and they were putting their hands up at the, at the top, and I was going to keep my hands in to be obedient. And as we hit the crest, it looked like we were in heaven, getting ready to fall down on earth. And the ride took off down the hill, up and down and around and around and around, and finally pulled up into the station. And my mother looked at me, and I looked at her, and I just yelled in excitement, like, yes! This is wonderful. And I, I got off, and I grabbed her hand, and I went back around the park, and I went to go find all the other kids. And I said, you have to ride this ride because it changed my life. And I'm telling you that today God has us all in line for the same ride. That our lives, too, can be transformed. He's going to reveal something big to us each and every day, but we have to get it individually before it's revealed to the whole congregation so that change in the world has to be made. But he's not going to leave us to ourselves because just as we walk through the guide rails, the Holy Spirit will lead us to our destination and where we need to go. And with joy and excitement, we can be obedient to what God says. I'll tell you, if he says, keep your hands in, keep your hands in. Don't try to stand up and peer over but be obedient unto him and, and being obedient unto him, enjoy the ride and the process that God will have you on because the end result is you will be a changed person. Today, I ride every roller coaster in the world that I go to. That made me different. God makes you different and will transform you in the same way. 
So I encourage you, go out there and be ye transformed. Renew your mind. Begin to change the world in each and every day of your life, starting with yourself and with your home and with your family. Bring your likeness. If God's telling you to get your family in order, then get your family in order. Everything else will stand still because it's about what God wants today because his revelation will come true. And at the end, we know that the fight will be won by him. Because in Christ we have the victory. We are being discipled and transformed so that we too can make disciples.